You're listening to Aviation Marketing Hangar Flying, the community for the best sales and marketing professionals in the aviation industry. You can't learn to fly just from a book. You learn from other pilots who know the tools, the skills, and the territory. Your hosts, John and Paula Williams, are your sales and marketing test pilots. They take the risks for you and share strategies, relevant examples, hacks, and how-tos. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes so you won't miss a thing. So, welcome to our book club discussion. Uh, this month, we are talking about The Content Code by Mark W. Schaefer. And this was actually kind of a surprise. Um, we had a different book planned, but we weren't able to get enough of them uh, to work for our book club. So, um this was a little bit of a surprise. I had not read the book before, so we took a little bit of a chance with this one, and I think it actually turned out pretty good. I'm Paula Williams. And I would be John Williams. And we are ABCI, and ABCI's mission is? To help all you ladies and gentlemen out there sell more products and services in the aviation world. Absolutely. So first impressions of the book. What did you think? Old hat. Old hat? Yeah, this is what you've been espousing since I've known you and you had your company running with minor exceptions. And, and, and actually, as I read through this, I think, oh, roughly two thirds of the way through it. Um, it's like there was something missing and I still don't know what that was, but it's like he missed whatever it was he was trying to hit the nail on the head. And I, I don't know what it was because he said all the stuff that you already say and you tell all your people. Right. Well, so. it's interesting because I was kind of excited about the book, you know, because the premise is that um, it's a nice follow on to Laura Hanley's book, you know, um, about content that converts. Uh, that was last month's book. And it started with quality content or started with the assumption of quality content, which for this book, that just assumes that's table stakes, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. You've got fabulous content. If you don't have fabulous content, then you're just out of the game anyway. That's right. You're not in the game. Right. Um, so I thought Laura Hamley's book was fabulous for that purpose. And then this book, the promise of it was to kind of pick up where that one left off and say, okay, now you've got fabulous content, but you're having a hard time getting enough readers or listeners or um subscribers or friends or fans or you know whatever you call them this is supposed to be the missing piece of that and i don't know that it necessarily fulfilled on that promise i was expecting maybe something more you agree yeah i'm not sure i know what it was but toward the end of it he I, the thing i got out of it was that nobody really knows what's going on mm -hmm. um Nobody oh. has the content code figured out. Well, they may think they do, but the problem is, as he says, there is so much out there, mm -hmm. and you are trying to get people to read it without selling anything, mm -hmm. and then Google's trying to do their thing. Google is, is making it worse because they don't know what they're doing either. They think they do, mm -hmm. but... Uh, doing what they do, then everybody with content is doing what they do, and, and I think it's a vicious circle. And don't, it's, it, you're lucky in some respects if you actually get somewhere, particularly if you're starting. Right, right. So um, content shock is what he calls it, actually, in yeah. the first uh, right. first chapter. He talks about the ignition switch, you know, and that being where your content and your audience match up and most people have great content but they don't have a great audience to start with mm -hmm. um and you know that's really the missing piece um one example that he talks about the mirabeau miracle right um you know this is a people see just one little piece of a story and you know in this case we've got like a 49 second video that went viral right and uh, got 11 million views, which is fabulous on on um, on YouTube. What they don't tell you, or what you don't see in that sense, you know, I mean, this is a person who has a winery, and uh, you know, is using content to sell wine, which is fabulous. You know, there's um, it has a really cool business model, and 
has a really engaging personality, has, you know, a lot of the things that you need to make this happen. Uh, but what you don't see is that there were two or three years of work ahead of this video. Right. Um, of doing little videos every single week and doing the pedestrian work of acquiring an audience one person by one person and responding to comments and, and doing all of the things that that they talk about in the book to make this happen. So, you know, this didn't just, this isn't, this is, you know, the 10 year overnight success story, right? Well, and this because it went viral and had 11 million views does not mean he made 11 million sales. Exactly. You know, he talks about the example of, you know, getting an article published uh, or retweeted by Guy Kiyosaki, who has, Guy Kawasaki, sorry, who has a Twitter audience the size of France, right? You remember that story? <laughs> and all it did was crash his servers, and none of those people ended up being customers or even repeat subscribers. You know, it didn't have any long-term effect on um, Mark Schaefer's business, right? Mm -hmm. So going viral isn't really the goal here. The goal here is to build an audience and to make sales. So a lot of people get this confused, and a lot of the folks that I talk to day in and day out, they're just like, well, what do I have to do? to get these kind of results, you know, to get something to go viral. And I'm like, it's accident. Yeah. That's not the goal. You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> we need to keep our eye on the ball here. And, if, and if you can do one of those that goes viral and actually have a CTA in it, mm -hmm. then you might have accomplished something, but, but you can't, those things never happen with a call to action. Right. Well, and the difference between the Mirabeau Malik, Mirabeau miracle and the Guy Kawasaki retweet, you know, between those two stories were that he built up to this. So, um, you know, the, the thought behind Mirabeau Wine was to collect people who have an interest in this, uh, you know, and not just borrow an audience from a celebrity and, you know, build the numbers that way. So this was kind of a natural building and an organic and a over time and a, you know, long-term strategic building. The other one was simply an accident, a happy accident, you know? And so the long-term strategy worked, the happy accident didn't, <laughs> you know, in terms of sales. Hope is not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy, right? Okay, so let's talk about what you were talking about before, and that is uh, content saturation, right? Um, so, there is a way that uh, he puts forth in the book that I think is kind of clever to figure out the content saturation index of any particular topic, right? Yeah, as long as the clever doesn't overcloud what's real. <laughs> That's true. You know, the <laughs> neat thing about aviation is that it is such a niche topic that there are very few things that are really going to have content saturation uh, are going to hit that point. Um, the problem is that all of our customers are living in other worlds besides aviation. In fact, we were talking earlier today, John, about how you're just tired of content altogether, not necessarily aviation content, but just getting hit with everything. Exactly. I, and if I do a search on the web and, and the product or service page comes up, they better sell me within about 10 seconds or 15 seconds because I'm not going to go any further. I don't mm -hmm. have to. Somebody else will have it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I just, uh, I, 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 I mean, I do all this with you, and I see all this going on, but that's not me. Mm -hmm. and, and I know I'm not, I'm a different kind of guy, but still, <laughs> I read for pleasure, mm -hmm. and I read uh, financial stuff to keep us afloat, and I read uh, technical stuff from the IT perspective. And that's enough. Mm -hmm. you don't <laughs> there's, go, a, there's a lot to read just to keep things going. You don't go seeking out videos on how to open a bottle of wine with your shoe. No. Okay. I mean, I look at videos, but, but the videos I look at, if they're more than about 10 to 15 seconds, I don't do it. Interesting. But that's just me. Right. Exactly. Okay. So, um, all right, let's let's go back to this content saturation index and the the formula that he suggested is to use your keyword in quotation marks and the the, the word and 
blog or and podcast or and whatever medium it is that you're anticipating to use as your primary content medium, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this one is air charter and blog. And you can see there's over a million results. So almost 2 million. Right. Exactly. Almost 2 million results, which, um, makes you think, Hmm, if I want to start a blog about air charter, I may be facing a, a more uphill battle than I would have been years ago. Right. Well, on top of that, um, I may have misread the book or misunderstood, but I got the feeling that, that his premonition or whatever it is that blogs basically is not where you're going to get the data you want anyway. Exactly. You could do podcast or, um, you know, you may find that your niche is saturated, but there's no podcast there. Or you may find that your niche is saturated, but there's no videos there. Uh, you know, there's no YouTube channel there. So there's always a way to oh, yeah. do what you want to do. You just have to find a way that somebody else isn't already doing in that niche. Exactly. Glommed onto and, and locked up the entire audience. Okay. So um, one thing you can also do is make it more specific. So if you did private air charter and blog, so that's a small change, uh, but it's a big change to the type of content you might want to do, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you focus a little bit more and you've got a quarter of that saturation level, right? Uh, well, 50,000 is less than a quarter, I'll tell you that. That would have been a quarter of a million. Mm -hmm. no, oh, that yeah. would have been less than that, 50,000? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm reading it wrong. I had the decimal, decimal in the wrong place. That's like 4%. So 50,000 versus 2 million, um, you know, you have a much better chance of getting quality content read by people who have an interest in private air charter, right? Yeah, that's about two and a half percent. Cool. Exactly. So that is a, um, a way to really target the opportunity and to find out, you know, if you're determined you want to do a blog, which um, a lot of people are really good at writing. And, you know, just because he says blogs may be pa passe, um, if that is what you really want to do, you can find a way to find some space in a crowded marketplace, right? Sure. Cool. And that's a really interesting way of doing it. Let's do one more of those. Let's do aircraft sales. Uh, very crowded field, right? Mm. Um, actually, not nearly as crowded as air charter, but still um, 122,000 results. Uh, lots of people writing about aircraft sales. But if you say business jet sales, you know, as opposed to you know, uh, Moonies or Pipers or Bonanzas or King Airs or anything like that, um, it's 39,000 versus 122,000. So um, once again, you can find a um, an easier place to make your mark uh, or find an easier way to uh, find an audience that isn't saturated with content, right? Yes. Cool. Okay, so that's Content Saturation Index, and that is actually very, very smart uh, to find a way to make sure that there's enough of an audience there without too much competition. Um, once again, kind of the prime directive in marketing is uh, high demand, low supply, right? Yes. Okay, so this tells you what the supply is, and then the other side of that is you want to look at the demand, see how many people are looking for those keywords. Um, but that's an SEO topic that we've covered in great detail in other book conversations, right? <laughs> Okay. Absolutely. Cool. All right. I did like the way he broke out the three H's, right? Um, hygiene content, hub content, and hero content. Um, their hygiene, hygiene content, I actually don't really like that word. I, like. I don't either. That, that just didn't click. <laughs> I, I like the term information snacks. So, you know, that's what we call it in our practice, but it's the same uh, same thing as what he's talking about with the hygiene content. So basically, Nobody, I mean, everybody's like John, right? <laughs> Nobody is willing to spend more than 15 seconds um, on a topic unless it really catches their in interest. So um, a lot of times if we have a complex topic, we really need to break that down into neat little factoids or something interesting to capture their attention and maybe teach them something they didn't know without them feeling tired, right? Mm -hmm. Looking at a big block of text or a horrible long video or something like that. Okay. 
So that's hygiene content. Um, we do that several times a week. Um, you know, a good example of that is our digital marketing program um, where we do the information snacks um, for that kind of thing. Hub content, though, can be longer. And I have seen Mr. Williams himself uh, spend an hour in a webinar um, on a topic that's of interest to him, right? When have you seen such a thing? Last week. We went to a Surely webinar Surely such on... a travesty. <laughs> <laughs> it's never it's occurred. It's a movie. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, we went to, um, we attended a, a webinar on search engine optimization uh, that was put on by um, SEMrush. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, if it is a topic that you're interested in, I think every 15 seconds earned the next 15 seconds. So, you know, you're always in danger of people leaving if, if your content isn't interesting. But um, you can do long form content and those people are more likely to be buyers because they're seriously interested in your content and you don't really want to get people addicted to the sugar high. You want to have kind of a balanced diet here, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the information snacks are great, but every once in a while you got to throw people some meat and potatoes, right? That's an interesting way of saying it, but yes. Okay. And then the hero content, this is kind of the mythical unicorn of what everybody wants to do. But it really has to be built on a foundation of the other two, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you look at some of the really great marketing that's happened, you know, the Budweiser, um, you know, Clydesdale um, commercials with the puppy. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's emotional, inspirational, um, you know, really great stories that may or may not have anything to do with the product, but that really uh, connect with the brand. And, uh, you know, that's the sort of thing that we aspire to, uh, but you can't start there. You know, you have to have really great um, hygiene content, hub content. You really have to engage, you know, I mean, Budweiser has invested millions of dollars, possibly billions of dollars in their um, marketing infrastructure, their um, distribution plan, you know, their business to business marketing, you know, all of the meat and potatoes and the information snacks to get to the point where they can successfully do that type of hero content. Um, so, you know, a lot of people want to start there. It isn't going to work, right? You got to crawl before you run. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, we should think in terms of the so what, you know, why are we doing what we're doing? You know, um, we're doing what we're doing because we believe in the aviation industry and we believe that there's a lot of really crappy marketing in the aviation industry and it's taking people's money and destroying people's lives. You don't have to believe it. You can see it. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, you know, that's what gets us up in the morning and gets us to go rescue customers from bad marketing, um, you know, and having their business fail because they're spending money on random acts of marketing. Um, and that um, is kind of the, the so what to me. And maybe we don't say that enough. So, you know, what I pulled from that um, book that we should do differently probably is more of the so what, right? Well, do you need that in every everywhere in life? Absolutely. Yeah. Otherwise, <laughs> it's just um, technical. You know, you can be very successful based on the other two, but you don't get the so what. You know, why are we here? Why are we doing this? Um, and you'll be even, imminently more successful if you can answer the so what appropriately. Absolutely. All right. So um, next section that I thought was really cool, um, building shareability into your content. This is kind of the nuts and bolts uh, of what's useful about this. Um, you know, you assume you have great content. Um, if you don't have great content, go read Laura's book again. <laughs> and work through that. But assuming you have great content and you still don't have a fabulous audience, um, there's a lot of things that you can do. And, uh, you know, I know probably some of these stand out more than others, depending on what you're doing and what your, your situation or your interest is, right? Yes. So which of these was the most interesting to you? None of the above. None of the above. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if it's interesting, I don't need to be, I mean, you have to have something there so I can share it with somebody, but don't try to convince me to share it whether I like it or not. Right. <clears throat> um, but it yeah, does. But that's just me. That's not yeah. life. 
but it has to come across your horizon, right? So you, it has to hit you at a time when you happen to be reading. Well, when I'm reading it and I like it, and I said, you know, I think Joe would like to see this. And then mm -hmm. I need to be able to see a button somewhere I can push and type in his email address. Absolutely. Um, one thing I kind of disagreed with is he said, knock down all the walls. Um, you know, I actually like having some gated content behind a wall that you have to put in uh, some contact information for. You know, it has to be very high value content or at least high perceived value content like checklists or um, tip sheets and uh, ebooks and other kinds of things. Um, you know, he says you should just give all that away. I think there's a fine line there. Um, and I think that some folks uh, that are qualified customers are going to have a better reaction to something that they have to do something for, you know, um, that causes them to pause and think, do I really want this checklist or am I just curious? You know, am I actually going to do something with this or not? You know, it's a two way street. Exactly. So, you know, I disagree on the, the walls item. Good. Um, we're not going to talk about all of these items, but I think there is a lot to be said for um, especially repurposing content. Um, I started adding some of our older courses to SlideShare, you know, just to get more mileage out of them because of um, some of the statistics that he gave on, um, you know, how to get more more eyeballs on old content using uh, the same materials. So if you can do that with not much more effort, you know, by all means repurpose, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so, you know, sometimes you can do less content, get more mileage out of it. The thing I let's see, what did he say? He said, uh, don't post because you should. Mm -hmm. But what was the rest of that? In other words, you don't you don't do it because you should. You do it because you're you need to. Yeah. <laughs> you're inspired to. For yeah, some exactly. Mm -hmm. So, and that thing, because I see from time to time when I run across stuff, it just looks like somebody did it. Because oh, it's two o'clock today. I need to put something out there. Yeah, it's uninspired and boring, right? Mm -hmm. That's like the capital sin. And marketing is to be boring. That's what uh, Dan Kennedy says anyway. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think he'd uh, revive capital punishment for that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and we do that too. Sometimes it will be several weeks. We actually pre-record a lot of our podcasts. Don't tell anybody. But um, just between us kids, we do pre-record some of our podcasts. And sometimes we will be inspired to do two or three or four of them because we're just totally on fire about something that... Um, a pro uh, somebody that we're working with said or a problem that someone had and we're like, we got to fix this. Uh, we got to write a podcast. Um, and sometimes it'll be two or three weeks before we do podcasts again because we're just, you know, nothing really hits us as important enough to sit down and do one, right? And sometimes you want a post to be funny mm -hmm. just to keep people off balance. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did one. I got an email from a friend of mine about FAA rules. Yeah. And you put it out there and it yep. got like 40,000 hits in, in like two days. Exactly. That was one of our best performing posts. And it was, you know, it, it makes me crazy because it was something that we didn't even work on. <laughs> All we did was just, you know, repost something that somebody else had sent us that was hysterical. <laughs> and uh, But funny works really, really well on the Internet. So It's just like a breath of fresh air. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so building an alpha audience. Um, I actually really liked his description of audience assumption disorder. This affects everyone. Um, you know, whenever you start a post with you all <laughs> y'all <laughs> need to do this or, you know, you all keep doing that. Um, you're suffering from audience assumption disorder. Um, you have to assume you're talking to one person and, you know, the very best bloggers, even the ones that have millions and millions and millions of people talk to one person at a time, right? That's because only one person is reading it. Even if you have three people sitting around a tube watching, mm -hmm. there's only one person in your mind that's reading it. Right. You have an audience of one at any given time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, assume, assuming more than that is just presumptuous and, and, and silly. So um, that one person that you're writing to, you, know, you want to know as much about that person as you can 
and get to know the folks that are, are visiting your blog and, and uh, listening to your podcast and, and all of those things. Um, I also really liked his advocate audience profile. Um, you want to find people who are going to, you know, some readers, listeners, commenters, fans, followers, whatever you want to call them, subscribers, are worth more than others. And the ones that are worth the most are people who are thought leaders in the field. They're in association leaderships. Um, you know, if you sell something that uh, is good for all pilots, then CFIs are a great um, advocate audience for you because they teach people. Um, you know, so some of our, our clients that sell, you know, logbook software or um, weather software and things like that, if you CFI learns about your software and starts using it in their practice, uh, you know, that's worth more than having just your average pilot dude um, start using your software, right? Or a blogger. Exactly. Um, bloggers talk about what they read and what they see. Mm -hmm. So they're worth more. Podcasters, journalists, you know, everybody who has an audience uh, is worth more than um, the average visitor who may not have an audience or, you know, you may, may just be a single customer, single potential customer, right? Yes. Cool. Anything else on this? No. I. You're smiling. Well, the assumption disorder is, is, has been around since before the technology. No, well, no, since, since before the internet and stuff, because there were people that saying, well, you ought to do this and you ought to do that. Yep. That's and you true. know what? You do your own yachtas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you do it, and then tell me about it. Yeah, I like the, um, you know, the old Dear Abby, and you know those those kinds of things in the newspaper used to talk about, you know, dear reader, you know. Right. It's like they're addressing you personally. <laughs> it's kind of a neat convention because it uh, gets right to the heart of that um, audience assumption disorder. And that's way before the technology and before blogging. And As a matter of fact, there's books that I've read recently where it says, and, and to the reader, I want you to think about. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's like the author's jumping out of the book and talking to you personally, which is, right. is the feeling that you really want to get. Okay, and then we get to the quotes. And I didn't include your favorite quote, um, which oh. is the one that you just mentioned about uh, – what was the one that you just said? <laughs> I don't know. I said several. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, um, above all, be interesting. Um, David Meerman Scott, um, build the smallest possible audience. Seth Godin. We actually read his book Tribes two months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like that idea. You know, you're not going for the hundreds of thousands of fake people. You're going for the smallest number. And this actually goes toward... Um, I think it is a Norman Vincent Peale saying about, you know, there's a hundred people in your life who are worth a million dollars to you or, you know, whatever. Um, there's a hundred people that you need to have a really good relationship with and that you really need to focus on. And anything beyond a hundred people is kind of a waste of time, you know? Um, and depending on what you're selling, I mean, obviously if you're selling, uh, software with 999, it's a little bit different than if you're selling um, G4s. Five, five, five million a copy. <laughs> exactly. So you know, in, in, but in either case, there is a number. You know, what is the smallest possible audience that will get you to your goal? And you know, how can you define that the most specifically? Right. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, very counter uh, counterculture, right? Mm -hmm. um, establish a communion of equals. I like that one too. Um, you know, you don't want to talk down to people. Uh, people may not know as much about marketing as we do. A lot of people know more about marketing than we do, but uh, they definitely know more about their product or service than we do. So, you know, we are a community of equal, equals and we don't ever want to give people the impression that we're um, disrespectful of them, especially, you know, because well, they may no, not know as much as we do. Sometimes we actually recommend our competitors. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Exactly. Um, speak to one person. Um, we talked about that one already. Establish a common dream. So, you know, the common dream for us is that nobody will ever commit random acts of marketing. 
and the industry will become so much more efficient and uh, and fabulous because of that, and everybody will be successful. All right. Next part, um, distribution, advertising, promotion, and SEO. This was the part that I was the most excited or the most hopeful to read, and I wish that there had been more here. I would say this is probably the weakest spot in the yeah, book. Yeah, right? he, he, he said you can't do it without this, but then he just it fell flat. Well, there wasn't really anything new here. And of course, um, we're probably I mean, not the target flat. audience. <laughs> we're probably not the target audience for this book because we do this all the time and we read 12 books a year on marketing. So um, actually, I probably read 24 books a year on marketing, but that's just between us kids. Um, you know, I didn't find anything incredibly helpful here. There were a few things, um, a few little tips and uh, new software and a couple of other things that uh, that I might try. Um, the obvious promise of this chapter, you know, without promotion, something terrible happens, and that is nothing, right? Okay. Yeah, P.T. Barham. Yeah, um, there's another quote that I really like. Uh, until something, until somebody sells something, nothing happens. Nothing happens. Nothing ever happens in the world until somebody sells something. You know, mm -hmm. if, whether it's an idea or or anything else. Even so. if you just sell yourself with respect to what you can do mm -hmm. or an idea you have to others. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many people I talk to who are so frustrated because their product is better <laughs> or their, um, you know, their service is better than their competitors. And yet um, they're not sell. making sales. Right? right. And that's just because they're not doing the marketing and, you know, the marketing does not do itself. Nothing sells itself. Right. Even your even your blog posts. Well, entropy. <laughs> entropy sells itself. Yeah, don't I don't do think any, so. Don't do anything, and things fall apart. Well, you know, there is that. But then also, if you wait long enough, things fall back together again. I don't know that we have that much time. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> okay. So um, I actually took this picture from the book. It's not the best. It's just a photograph. But um, you know, hopefully, this follows falls under the fair use um, provision of the copyright law. <laughs> but uh, I actually really liked this bit, uh, the relationship between SEO and content type. Um, so for your hygiene content or your information snacks, SEO is critical. You want to make sure that you're absolutely spending your time and money. And everybody has a limited amount of time and money, right? And everything needs to be optimized if people are going to find it. Right. And whether that's whether you do that yourself or whether you pay somebody to do it or whether you um, are just, you know, setting this up in your software, you know, whatever it is, it takes time and money to get this done. So where do you spend that time and money? You spend it on your hygiene content, um, your everyday content that explains, describes and helps. Right. Mm -hmm. Your information snacks um, is our preferred term. Um I hope everybody is doing hygiene, but <laughs> goes without saying, should go without saying. Nothing goes without saying. Right, but not everybody is doing information snacks, and that does need to happen as well. Um, in just about every industry, you have to be putting out some kind of information that establishes your, um, your credibility and positions you as somebody who is a resource and somebody who is helpful in your field. And then, um, you know, the hub content, that's, you know, things like webinars, um, evergreen storytelling is what they call it. Um, I think that's fantastic. Case studies, um, good articles, other things like that. SEO is important for that, but a lot of times that will be found on its own. And here you want to go for long, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, he says 2,000 words. It's interesting. We went to a um, a mastermind less than a year ago, and they were saying um, it was now longer because it went from 500 to 800 words, and now it's probably over 2,000 is, is your ideal length for yeah, that hub content. But I'm not sure where he got his information on that. Yeah, you're not convinced? No. Okay. Who the heck's going to read it? Um, obviously, people do, you know. Um, he had some some examples in there that I thought were were pretty good. I think um, in a lot of cases, what we're doing uh, in our on our website, especially, is we will have three or four articles on a particular topic, and once they get to a certain age, um, you know, maybe a year or two old, um, 
we'll string those together, uh, you know, and uh, consolidate that content into longer articles. And, uh, you know, they call that cornerstone content in search engine optimization. Here he calls it hub content. So I think there is something to that. Uh, then, you know, you want to make it scannable. You want to make sure that you're outlining it well and that you're putting in. Um, scannable by whom or what? Scannable by people. So okay. you want to put in subheads and lots of pictures. You want to make it visually attractive. You want to make it easy to easy for people to find the information they want in there. But putting all of your information on a particular topic together in one place is not a bad bad move, right? Mm. Um, so it's a good way to to kind of coalesce that hub content and hero content. He gives an example of a um, a term that he invented. You know, content shock. Uh, it was one of his best performing uh, articles. And the reason is because it was the reason why, you know, the reason why <laughs> you're not doing any good with your content is because of content shock. Um, so it was an innovative idea and SEO was less important because people find that nobody's going to be looking for content shock if you just invented the term. But uh, a lot of people are looking for the term, you know, why is nobody coming to my blog? <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else about this? concept no i mean i just reiterate what i've said is that if you are involved in the real world mm -hmm. where you have manuals for everything when things have a little hiccup and you have to go read a manual and you've got to go read a flight manual and you've got to go read a maintenance manual and you've got to go read the, you end up reading because you have to throughout mm -hmm. the day and now why am i going to go want to read all this stuff on the web well, in a lot of cases, you have to because, you know, for your work, you need to find the best solution to this problem. I'm just saying. And if you're in they marketing. Bet, but I'm not going to go look at 2,000 word article. You might, you know, if the answer's in there and it's easy to find. If, if, if. If, if, if. Absolutely. Okay. Cool. Qualifiers, qualifiers, qualifiers. All right. The mystery of authority. Um. This, he says, is the little a. You know, of course, the big A is audience. The little a is authority. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason is because you can always borrow it if you don't have it yourself, right? So they say. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, really the, uh, the emphasis there is on brand development. You know, you really want to make sure that every time people come across information from you, it's recognizable as being from you. Otherwise, you have just wasted your money. And a really good example of that, we went to a trade show not too long ago, and they had this fabulous magician. Um, and he was wandering the halls, doing tricks, doing all kinds of things and so forth and so on. But after the show, we talked to each other and we talked to a bunch of other people. Who was that magician with? Nobody knew. That's right. I remember that. Yeah. Nobody knew which company he was representing. I'm sure they paid him a lot of money uh, because he was doing a really fabulous job of capturing people's attention and entertaining people and keeping their attention for a really long time, but to no purpose from a marketing perspective. Right. Yeah. Because I know what we pay a magician. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this guy was at least that good, so uh, yeah. Who knows? But you know, the difference is when we had a magician at our booth, he was handing out um, playing cards with our logo on them. He was doing card tricks about you know your money disappearing when you do the wrong kind of marketing, or doubling your money when you do the right kind of marketing. I mean, he was very much tying it into right and telling them to, if you really want to know how to do this, to come talk to you. Exactly. And he was doing a great job of funneling people my way. So, so good of a job that it was uh, sometimes hard to keep up. As a matter of fact, we had the longest line of any other booth in the whole trade show. Right. So that was a great experience. But, you know, once again, um, if it's not connected to your brand, you know, it's, it's it doing no work. good. Yeah. So, you know, when you do those information snacks, a lot of people will put out, you know, like fabulous quotes from Benjamin Franklin or whatever and stuff like that. But then there's no connection to their company, to their product, to their logo. You know, they don't even put a logo on the on their little infographic, you know? It's crazy. And you have to remember, these things get detached in the World Wide Web. People send them to each other. Uh, they get sent in emails, you know, all kinds of crazy things happen. So you wanna make sure that everything is, is branded and that your branding is gonna stick to whatever you send out, right? 
-hmm. Okay. Audience and influencers. Um, you know, we talked about that and that's how you build authority. If, <laughs> um, as happened with Paxton Calvin East, our, um, client who sells, uh, WX24 Pilot, the uh, weather software, mm -hmm. um, Rod Machado gave him a nice testimonial um, on his website. So, you know, that influencer um, now has conveyed some of his authority, uh, you know, saying, this is really great weather software. And if Rod Machado says it, and he's a really famous CFI, um, then, you know, that means more than, you know, your average audience oh, member. Yeah, so absolutely. there's an authority factor there. Um, distribution, advertising, promotions, SEO, you know, we talked about how that builds your authority. If you are at the top of the search engine, that article becomes more credible by virtue of where it sits than everything else. Uh, they think, wow, these people must know what they're doing. They must have invested to, to get that article there. Um, and authority. Um, shareability embedded in each piece of content. We talked about that, you know, the 22 different ways of making sure that that happens and social proof and social signals. So once again, if you've got an audience of some number that's larger than any of your competitors, does that really mean anything? Um, it may in the minds of some folks who feel like, you know, this is somebody that's really invested and a lot of people seem to agree with them. So what does that spell? <laughs> that red word. <laughs> Badass, right? Exactly. I hope we can say that on, uh, without getting blocked by iTunes. But um, I really like the the section in the book where he said, you know, okay, I'm done writing. I can't come up with anything better than that acronym. So <laughs> <laughs> we're done now. Can't add any more items because this is just too cool, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, the future of content and ignition. This is the part that is the least inspiring for me because you know obviously nobody knows and obviously it's a moving target so everything you know will be different tomorrow right and this is a really really good quote in spite of the fact that you're not supposed to read and so forth i don't know that you are actually seeing this you may be just listening so it says when you finish changing you are finished and guess who said that mr benjamin franklin Absolutely. And it has our branding on there. So if somebody steals the slide, <laughs> <laughs> it has our little insider circle branding on there. So, um, but absolutely, you know, um, the interesting thing is all of the principles that were true in marketing in 1950, 1920, 1890, um, caveman days, you know, any, as far back as you want to go, people had the same problem. They needed to get their message across, they needed to get it understood by the right people, they needed people to understand it, and they needed people to take action. So, you know, all of the principles of marketing are the same, but all of the tools are different every single stinking day, right? Mm -hmm. You know, how you accomplish those those same tasks is, is really different today than it was in 1950 or, you know, whatever, what, any time period you want to name. So that's the frustrating part. But it's also the inspiring part, right? True. Yeah. Right. This will never get old. We will never be out of a job. See, because we'll never finish changing. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So next month we are um, discussing the charisma myth. I know they have enough of them. They are on their way to us by Amazon Prime box with a smiley face, right? Is that made by drone? Could be. <laughs> I don't know. Do they do drones now? Some places. <laughs> we'll have do. to see how that uh, shows up. It may be on our porch this very moment because, uh, you know, you never know. But anyway, The Charisma Myth uh, by Olivia Fox Cabane. And uh, hopefully that will uh, be coming out to you soon. And uh, this is one that I haven't read before either, but it was highly recommended to us. So that will be fabulous, hopefully. Great. All right. America needs the business. So go sell more stuff. <laughs> right. We end with uh, that quote by Zig Ziglar. So um, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you listening and uh, would love to hear what you thought of the book. Uh, make sure you leave us a comment. We'll see you next time. Ciao. Thanks for joining us for Aviation Marketing Hangar Flying. 
the best place to learn what really works in sales and marketing in the aviation industry. Remember to subscribe on iTunes and leave a rating. You know you could.